much is it? You know anything? Now that's what I'm talking about! Hello again, and welcome to a brand new series of The Gadget Show, again. Yeah, we're here every week, right up until the end of the year. Yep, so clear your diaries on a Monday night, hit that series link button and brace yourself for a seemingly endless sea of tech. Yeah, and we're starting off with a challenge that I think it's fair to say, Susie, is potentially one of the most technically challenging we've ever faced. Absolutely. Yeah. Check this out. You're going to love it. There are challenges, and then there are challenges. And this one was looking like it could be massive. It began bright and early one morning in Northamptonshire. Well, once again, Steve, we find ourselves at a racetrack ready to receive a challenge. We do. We've been summoned again once more. I shall open the envelope. This week's challenge... <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. ...is to build the world's most brilliant remote control oh. car. And then you're going to race it against a couple of bangers. Oh. Oh. So our challenge was to build one of Go! these, capable of racing against some of these, and to make it the world's most brilliant remote control car. We've got a lot of experience of remote control cars on the Gadget Show, and we even hold an RC land speed record. But, you know, I reckon pitting one of these little fellas against one of these big brutes does throw up a couple of incompatibility issues. These are full-size cars, yeah. so we need to build something full-size. I, I reckon I know just the guy to talk to. Seriously, a guy I've worked with before on the Gadget Show. Yeah. I'll give him a call. Job done. As technical wizards go, Dr James Brighton is a genius. He converted this full-size Hummer into a whopper of an RC car last year, a two-tonne off-roader which I got to drive with just a couple of small joysticks. It was a truly amazing creation and surprisingly straightforward to drive. I love this toy! <laughs> so, if we could get him to build us one like this, job done! Well, it's not job done. Why? Because we've got to build the most brilliant remote control car in the world. OK. I'm thinking we've got to get more techie. OK, no, I think you're right. Any ideas? I'm thinking telepresence. I could snug you. There is nothing better than a nice 32-incher on Christmas morning. I'm just joking. I know exactly what you mean. It's a brilliant idea. Good. Come on! So what actually is telepresence? Well, it's a way of being there without being there. It's remote control robotics with knobs on that allows operators to interact with and experience environments from afar. Telepresence robots are already being used to explore our deepest oceans and distant planets. And the military have bought into it big time with a whole array of telepresence battle bots, some of which can be controlled from thousands of miles away. And now, this cutting-edge technology is being used in medicine. This is the Da Vinci machine. It's the most advanced surgical telepresence robot in the UK. And even though it costs over a million pounds, Windsor Urology Department incredibly allowed us, a couple of complete novices, to use it to perform a very delicate operation. Ready, Dr. Bradbury? The patient's ready, Dr. Perry. OK, Dr. Perry, I think there's a, a guitar in his chest. It looks a bit dodgy to me. Could you try and go for that? Yeah. What you're seeing here is Susie's movements scaled down by hardware and software so that these tiny, tiny little hands, the robot's hands, are able to pick up that miniature guitar thing so well, Susie. Really, you have missed your vocation. Well done, Dr. Perry. I'm really enjoying this. I think you're actually very good at this. <laughs> The beauty of this system is that it allows surgeons to work with greater precision. This makes operations less invasive and speeds up recovery. And while my actions were scaled down, my view was scaled up through the terminal stereoscopic screens fed by two HD cameras, which provided me with a detailed 3D view of what I was doing. I'd like you to now go for the skull and crossbones in the middle of his, his chest there. But the reason we were really interested in this was that it clearly showed us the beauty of remote working. Susie was sat just a few metres away, but because her movements were being interpreted by a computer before being sent to the instruments, there's no reason, given a quick enough internet connection, why she couldn't have performed just as well sat thousands of miles away. Oh, absolutely expertly done. Do you know what's weird? I actually believe that the little man is underneath me here and that the hands and the pincers are here. And when I look here and it's just my fingers, it's totally bizarre. It's really weird. Feeling of telepresence. That's what it's all about, the feeling of being there without being there and the ability to interact from afar. We were beginning to think that this technology was what could make our remote control car amazing. 
Now, the police and customs are also really keen on this idea. This is a micro drone and it's built for surveillance. It's 60 centimetres wide, it weighs less than a bag of sugar, and from 500 metres away, it can take pin sharp images, whether it's day or night. It's amazing. Yeah, as you can see, I am flying this using standard RC radio control. Um, I've also got these really cool glasses on, which give me a point of view from the drone. And it's just this kind of setup that we need, except, of course, in a car. What do you mean, like this? This is the VTS camera car. Its toy driver has a camera in his head that feeds live pictures to your video goggles, which makes it one of the most fun RC cars you can drive. Yeah, you see, that, that is perfect, except 50 times bigger. Yeah, definitely yeah. 50 times bigger. we better get to work. Come on, then. Oh, that Da Vinci is absolutely amazing. It's amazing. Oh, the thing that I find impressive is that they're now operating on people as we speak, with those machines on all over the UK. On a daily basis. But get you with your telepresence surgery. You're really good. You're like a proper doctor. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was completely immersed. I just couldn't believe what, what I was doing. I've actually got a lump. I, was, I thought you might have a look at it. I might need whipping out. Mm? Yeah. Could you have a look? Just... <laughs> So, obviously, it was going to be very difficult to make a remote control <laughs> racing car that actually what? made you feel like you were driving it. But I think that you're going to be amazed <laughs> with the results. Anyone got a torch? You're not going to be amazed with that. Put it away. <laughs> so, stick around to see whether we can build a machine capable of standing up to this sort of treatment. Oh! oh just power! Use the wall. Power's power. on, baby! And if you're considering investing in a new iPhone, John may have some surprising news for you. Now, I want to talk to you about touchscreen phones. A couple of months ago, Apple launched this, the iPhone 3GS, an upgraded and apparently faster version of their iconic handset. But the iPhone's position in the smartphone market is under attack like never before. On the very same day, Nokia launched this, rather sophisticated N97 touchscreen phone. And pretty soon, we'll be getting this, the Palm Pre touchscreen phone. Now, the reason I'm holding a picture of it is because we haven't actually got it available in the UK just yet. But because it promises to be genuinely a real iPhone killer, because they've had it on sale in the United States for a couple of months now, and because on The Gadget Show we're not the sort of people to let mere oceans hold us back, I travelled to New York to test all three phones against each other. New York is chock full of iconic sites and finding them would be a great way to test the usability of my phones. First up, the iPhone 3GS. The S stands for speed as it's significantly faster than the old model. The iPhone interface redefines smartphones and we're all getting familiar with it, I think. You know, the double tap on a piece of text, it automatically expands to fill the screen so you can read it. You can pinch to zoom in and out. The virtual keyboard on the screen is pretty good, providing you haven't got too much text to enter. And in this 3GS for speed, you do get a bit more extra zip. Aha! New York Public Library. That sounds interesting. Let's go there. The new features include a compass to orientate your maps, though I didn't find it that accurate, and the tall buildings seem to affect the GPS. I'm definitely on East 42nd Street, 
but the map's telling me I'm on East 41st. A small but significant difference. Ah, there it is, New York Public Library, another splendid old building. It's got 88 miles of bookshelves in there. But there's no time to look at them today. I've got another two phones to test. My second contender was the Nokia N97, a phone with a touchscreen and a QWERTY keyboard. Unfortunately, the touchscreen was nowhere near as responsive as the iPhones. And while it had good maps and the most comprehensive feature set of the phones, it was slow to react and let down by a clunky interface. Compared to the iPhone, it's frustrating not being able to sort of swish around the touchscreen. The menus are a lot less intuitive, and the whole thing seems to hang and freeze irritatingly often, as though the processor just can't cope with what you're asking it to do. Urgh, quicker to ask a, a human. Excuse me, could you tell me the way to Times Square? A disappointing start from the Nokia. Would the Palm Pre do any better? Like the others, it has Wi-Fi and GPS, and like the Nokia, you can have lots of applications open simultaneously. You immediately notice the Palm Pre's excellent touchscreen and its very intuitive interface. You can easily swish between open applications. If you don't like them, you can get rid of them. To go back in applications, you do a sort of back flip there. And it's all very, very sleek. The screen was smaller than the other two, and again, the phone could be a little slow at times. But its user-friendly interface rivals the iPhones. On to my second test, photo and video. For that, I needed the glorious views from the top of the Rockefeller Center. Gosh, what a view! The new iPhone has a 3-megapixel camera, but annoyingly, still no flash. Picture quality, though improved, is still distinctly mediocre. However, it's the first iPhone to offer video, at last. Next up, the Nokia. The N97's got a more complex camera, but you do get a lot more options. For example, you can shoot widescreen video, and you get a flash, although only an LED one. The 5 megapixel pictures looked much crisper, and the video was slightly better too. Finally, the Palm Pre. Like the iPhone, it has a 3 megapixel camera. On the palm, you get a nice bright screen so you can see what you're shooting, and you do get an LED flash, though there are virtually no other options. And it won't shoot video. It's going to have to do better than this to compete with the others. My final test was communication, keeping in touch via email and social networking. Dear Susie, having a great time in New York. Sorry, you had to stay in the office. All three phones automatically update your email, and the iPhone's accelerometer switches the keyboard to landscape mode for quicker typing. The Nokia was also very comprehensive. When it comes to email, I can also use webmail, or I can also use Nokia's messaging push email service, which is really rather good. What I particularly liked about the Palm Pre was its combined messaging feature. So you can send someone a text message, they can reply in instant messenger, and it all appear as part of the same conversation. But again, it lacks some simple features like block deleting messages. Uh, I've got time for this. What a future look at. Time for G ratings, and the Nokia N97 just scrapes three Gs. Its huge range of features are let down by slow reaction times and that clunky interface. Coming in second is the Palm Pre with a comfortable three Gs. It's got a great new design, which could be a real rival to the iPhone if only it didn't lack some basic features. And four Gs for the iPhone 3GS. Despite a few niggles, it's a very well-designed and connected bit of kit. Where's your cat? Hello, cat. Under there somewhere. Hello, Belle. Hello, Belle. Hello, gorgeous. I wanted to tell you about this, actually. Hello. It's called Pet's Eye View, and it's a tiny little digital camera in a, this waterproof house, and it takes photographs every minute, and then you can just download them afterwards with a USB Issue, cable. This is Belle, and she's testing out the technology. She's been wandering around for half an hour or so, taking pictures of the studio, and we can tell exactly where she's been. If you've got a cat and it keeps disappearing... Hello, Hi, sweetheart. Belle. Hello, gorgeous. It's quite good to show <laughs> where they've been. I love it. I think it's brilliant. What I need to do is get that off a... Hang on a second. Come on, so Belle. I get the laptop? Yeah. Come on, sweetie. And then we just take the collar off... OK. ..and we just plug it into the, um, the USB there. Yeah, Belle, do you want to see your...? Yeah, tech cat, look. OK, that's... Right. 
That's the carpet. That's part of the... Oh. Ah, oh, there's look, my shirt. That's good. There's my hand, and we're obviously chatting about the camera at this point. Come on, Belle. That, oh, there's... Look. There is the obviously, studio. She, she was that on the side. Like I mean, the images are very low res, but, but you, get the, you get the idea that you can see where your dog or cat have, uh, have been, or maybe your little vole that you want to fix up with the camera. <laughs> you wouldn't get much of an image, because it would be so heavy, the vole would just lie there like that. Come on. It's not exactly a Hollywood production, but, you know, the images are, are easy enough to make out. That might not be, but she's doing her own Hollywood performance over here. Little action movie going on. <laughs> action cat, Come on, look. Belle. <laughs> right, if an hour of The Gadget Show is not enough for you, don't forget, there's loads more on our website, 5.tv slash Gadget Show. Web TV is our online show, and you'll find a new episode on our website every week, even when the TV show's not on air. Each week, John takes a first look at new tech, Dion brings you the very latest tech news, and Otis gets to grips with some more unusual tech. Plus, there's behind-the-scenes videos showing what goes on on gadget show shoots. Time for another short break now, but after that... We build the biggest and best remote control car in the world. How was that? It was fantastic. You enjoyed it. It was I think amazing. <laughs>
And for that, we appropriated a distinctly unglamorous hut 10 metres away from the track and set about creating a remote driving position which replicated as closely as possible actually being in the car. We fitted four Panasonic video cameras to the car, two at the front to provide full forward vision, one on the right to cover the inside of the track and one out the back. All of these pictures were beamed back live to our gadget show bunker through a rack of beefy microwave transmitters that also needed fitting to the car. Turn on your screens and tell me if the cameras are in the right place. All right, I've got you, sir. He's looking good. Thank you. OK, so just slightly to the left, slightly to the little tiny... That's a bit more. Susie, you're looking good, girlfriend. I'm coming in. Susie Perry off the TV. Can't believe it. And for the full driving experience, we'd gone for a pucker Vision Racer gaming chair. But because this time it would be controlling a real car rather than a game, it needed some modifications to make the controls do what we wanted. There's some special electronics inside here, OK? The gubbins has been severely messed around with. So when I push the accelerator, that sends a signal to a box under here. Now, that is a standard radio control transmitter. It will now transmit whatever I put through this control system to the real car. We can drive the car from here. A real car, fully sized, all we've got to do to get the ball rolling is flick this switch. That's the ignition. Look at this, you've done a great job. I think you should be the first test driver. Go for it. OK. OK. Whoa, nice. It's live. Here we Hit go. The ignition. Oh! This oh. was it. After weeks of planning and a whole lot of hammering, screwing, tweaking and programming, our remote control telepresence car was ready for its very first test drive. You are now ready to rock and roll. Off <laughs> the brake. Sees you moving now. This is you oh. under your own steam. OK. Our theory was sound. OK, go for it now. Nice. Nice, a little bit of power. But would it survive the first bend? Mount the curb. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? If the curb is there... If there's something to mount, I always say. Absolutely. There's a slight... There's a back... Well, a tiny delay to the screen, obviously, now, because the digital... That's signal. right, but the actual um, controls are pretty spot-on, aren't they? And as if driving a two-ton car remotely wasn't enough pressure, the circuit steel catch vent was playing havoc with reception and messing up my pictures. This could be a major problem in the race. Nevertheless, after three or four laps, I was really getting a feel for it. So you've got it on the money! Now all we needed to do was to get faster. How was that? It was fantastic! You enjoyed it. it I think amazing. you did really well. Time for my go. And all of those years of playing computer driving games weren't wasted. Oh, oh I love that. Oh, oh, oh. I took to it like a duck to water. Although, to be honest, my style wasn't for the faint-hearted. <laughs> Typical bloke, just way too quick. The old red mist on the corner. This was easy. <laughs> also, I thought. Oh. <laughs> it had all been going so well, but Jason's need for speed could have thrown away all our hard work. What was I like? I was there. I was going quick. I was getting all the corners right. I got my angles right, which I've learned through years of video games playing. And then that bit of concrete just jumped out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the question is, did I completely ruin our chances of putting our telepresent car in a real race? Nope. You just scraped the paintwork and broke the indicator. Yes. So, woo, join us after the break to see a world first. Our full-size remote control telepresence car being driven by us in a little porter cabin on a real racetrack with real racing cars and real racing drivers. Yeah, it really is a spectacular piece of television. Make sure you're here to see it. Welcome back. Let's get straight on with the action. Now, you'll remember, in this week's challenge, we had to build the world's most incredible remote control car. And we ticked that box. <gasps> a great big red marker, like that, in the build box. But the challenge wasn't over yet. No. Nope. Because we were building it for a purpose, to race against real people. 
We had come a long way in a very short time to build the world's best remote control car, a full-sized Range Rover driven from a computer gaming chair surrounded by live images on LCD screens. After a few early setbacks and just a few near misses, our car was looking quick. We'd even solved the intermittent video problem that dogged us in practice by replacing the analog transmission system with a more robust MEL digital unit that produced rock-steady pictures. But how good was our car? Oh, oh, Definitely don't! Oh, oh, no! Oh, no! Oh. Well, the time had come, the car was ready, the track was ready, we were ready. But there was just one last thing to do. Bring on the bangers for the race. I was feeling the need, the need for robotic telepresence speed. So the front row and the only row of today's grid of the race comprises three vehicles. Podge, here in the number 32. Have a look at this. So there's extra rubber on the tyre, so if it hits, it doesn't get a puncture. No radiator on the front of the car, water system inside. Look at this for safety. Sips. Steel reinforced doors, roll cage inside. Going to be doing any rolling today? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. OK, then obviously it's the Bradbury Perry Meister in the middle, the Range Rover. No driver inside there. And Matthew on the inside lane. The time for talking was over. It was time to start engines and let the best man uh, or machine win. This is Gran Turismo. This is like every racing game I've ever played. It's, it's just magnificent. Can you believe there's no one in there? Amazingly, Jason was holding his own, but this was a five-lap race and there was still a long, long way to go. I made a dash for the control room to give Jason support. Go for it, go for it, go for it. Come on, he's coming around the outside. Within a couple of laps, I was really struggling at the back. I was focused with every ounce of my being. Okay, I fall down. Oh! And amazingly, oh! I wasn't the first one to break. And he's gone off. He's gone off. You're in second. You're in second. Concentrate. Oh, oh. You're doing great. You're doing great. We're in the lead. We're in the lead. We're in the lead. But they came back with a vengeance. And now it was me who was fighting for my life. Oh! Because these banger boys play dirty. <laughs> oh, I got felt that. Eventually, after endless abuse. Oh, that was a bang. Oh, one of the banger boys got past. But with just one lap to go, there was no way I was letting the other one get through. Oh, power. Power's on, baby. Come on, oh, no! Incredibly, we'd come second. We may have been starting to celebrate, but the banger racers had other ideas. I'm over. Oh. I'm over. Ah. I'm over. that Range Rover was going to make it through to the end I of our think, challenge. You know what, I think you're so right. And <laughs> I, I was a little bit upset when it flew through the air because I'd, oh. I'd become quite attached to that setup. Do you know what I think was amazing, though? All your years of gaming clearly showed through because it was almost as though you were playing a game and you'd forgotten that that was a real car going around a real track. If I'd known, if I'd been in the, in the uh, arena hearing the engine roar uh, and hearing the tyres squeal, how quickly it had been going, I don't think I would have gone as quick. But because of that separation, yeah. I was driving it like there, there was plenty of tomorrows. And oh. I could just go as quickly as possible. Actually. Completely desensitised. And, and interesting, the perspective that we'd got with those cameras, that was exactly like the in-car view, which loads of you will be familiar with from video gaming. Yeah. Brilliant. Really, really good fun. But that's all we've got time for for the show tonight. So we'll see you next time. Although we're not actually real. No, we're, we're telepresenters. We're telepresent. yeah. telepresenters. This, whole, this is like a geek we're, robot operating. We're operated. telepresenters. We are. I, I'm actually a very good-looking man called Sven from Sweden. And I just put this whole geek thing on there for the gadget show. See you next time. Yeah, you see? Next time on The Gadget Show.
Lotus and I face a race across Britain as we try to find out if you can really live a totally wireless lifestyle these days. Yes! The race is on! I show you the amazingly addictive internet games you can play for free. Ah, oh, you're mine. Oh, yeah. And John tests some very intelligent cookers with the help of top chef Simon Rimmer. If this works, I will be very impressed.